All right, folks, welcome to the What the Futures podcast recorded in the UPL studio. I hope you're having a great day. Of course, this is the podcast with your weekly dose of clarity in the complex world of agriculture or crop marketing or farm business. All of the above is what I would say. My name is Ryan Denis. I am your host. Been your host now for 22 wonderful episodes, along with a few uh, add-ins from time to time. Uh, but I've had a lot of fun uh, putting the podcast together. Of course, I've spent my career working in agriculture, working on the grain side of the business. I am a farm kid from Dormy, Saskatchewan. Uh, but I was a grain buyer. I was a farm consultant. I was a uh, f- an analyst at times. I led a group of uh, advisors in Canada and the U.S. And here I am now behind the microphone at the uh, What the Futures podcast. So again, uh, welcome to the show. And we have a great show for you here this week. I've got Ryan Coppithorn with Cows in Control. Ryan uh, has been on the show a few times now. We're going to talk cattle markets. He's going to talk about this recent pullback in futures and what he expects in uh, in the near term here. Uh, of course, we'll have to talk about bird flu or avian flu, even though we don't want to. Uh, but Ryan does wrap it up nicely with some general uh, market direction. And um, spoiler alert, just a little bit of optimism there as well. So that's always a good sign. Uh, for our cattle markets. Of course, we'll get to our regular segments. We've got that popular mailbag seg- segment. We did get a new question this week. Of course, that's uh, brought to you by Pioneer Seeds. Uh, I'm going to wrap up the episode with a healthy serving of veggies because it's the right thing to do. And I'll say for that, that segment, um, I- I'm going to talk summer fill uh, urea, so fertilizer briefly. So just Hang in there if you're a, a, typically a summer fill type producer. You like to take your urea right after you put it in the ground. You like to fill the bins up right, a, right after. Uh, pay attention uh, to that to that last one. Uh, it uh, could pay dividends here. I guess we'll, we'll find out in a year or so, but it could pay dividends. Uh, all right. I, I, it's a lot of stuff going on this show. I've, I've got um, um, some things at the end, some housekeeping We've got uh, a hockey pool for playoffs, and I've got that playlist going as well. So again, folks, if you hang in here, we'll try to keep the episode nice and tight for you. Uh, But there's a lot uh, and some fun stuff uh, in this one. Uh, All right, I'm going to interrupt our episode here for a moment from our sponsor, John Deere. There's a whole new John Deere lineup that's out right now. New tractors, new combines. There's a new air car too. All with built-in intelligence that keeps getting smarter. Check them out at johndeer.ca. All right, folks, let's get after it here. Positive moments of the week. Well, I spent the Tuesday of, of this week, I spent it with Hans and Sarah at Blind Man Brewing in Lacombe, Alberta. All right, I got to do a behind-the-scenes tour. I got to be a part of the brewing process. So we're doing a small batch it's a Kolsch style beer, okay? And uh, I got to pick the what type of beer I wanted to have um, created. And uh, so small batch, or we're going to produce, they tell me, a couple of kegs out of this. And I got to go, like I showed up there, you know, Tuesday morning, um, got into the, the experience right away, got to go and see... Everything, of course, is a working operation. So got to, you know, tried to stay out of the way as best I could, but got to do a whole bunch of stuff and even be a part of the brewing uh, process for this beer. That's going to be, it's going to take about three weeks. It's going to sit in the, the the system for three weeks. I know they educated me on everything, but it's going to stay in that tank for three weeks. And it's going to come out as a couple of kegs, okay? One keg is going to a place called Beer Revolution. Uh, that's in downtown Edmonton. And every pint that they sell, the money from that is going to go to the Boyle Street Community uh, Services program. So Boyle Street, uh, those folks since 1971 have been helping uh, the homeless and helping with folks uh, suffering from poverty in Edmonton. So, uh, so that keg's going to Beer Revolution. 
And then I have another keg, and I'm I'm not sure what to do with the keg. So I know at the end of each episode, or most of them, I've been asking here lately uh, a question at the end. So my my question is, what should we do with this last keg? Let's say there's a second one. What should we do with it? And I need to come up with a name as well. So what you can do is you can email me, and you can say, hey, Ryan, here's a, a clever name for you that, that you can use. Um, or you could say what your opinion is. Maybe I just call it with the futures. Uh, and also give me an idea on what to do with this last keg. Like I was thinking, you know, is there an event that we could be at where we could serve this thing? You know, is someone going to host us in a shop sometime this summer and I'll bring along the keg in the shop? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm open to ideas. So let me know what you're thinking. Send me an email, ryan at whatthefuturespodcast.ca. And uh, you can see behind me, I've got a little, uh, a little uh, a prize pack here put together. I've got a little dream machine. That's a, a great Mexican lager from Blind Men, and a really funky hat there as well. Um, so send those in. I'll, I'll pick a winner here in a week, and uh, I'm going to send you some bevies and uh, and a cool new lid for you. Uh, you guys can't see my my hat collection behind me. I guess you can kind of see them now. They're all stacked there. My wife. I told my wife a couple months ago that I didn't have like any hats and now after starting the podcast uh and just working with partners and meeting a bunch of farmers i'm stacked i've got like 40 hats back there so i like to switch it up even got a new one this week from from blind man as well so uh switching it up there um i'm also i'm not drinking a beer today on the show i'm drinking something called hop water and Hans, if you ever listen to this episode, man, you really got to sponsor the pod after this. But uh, it's called Wander. It's hop water. It, so my guilty pleasure and my team, my team of advisors used to laugh at me all the time because like I'm a I'm a big dude. I'm a farm dude and like I'm a beer drinking dude. Right. But my guilty pleasure is sparkling water. And I, I'm not even talking about Perrier and Pellegrino. Like I go to the Italian center in, in Shore Park. And I buy the stuff I can't pronounce. Like, I'm a big sparkling water guy. Anyways, I was at the brewery, and they have this sparkling hop water called Wander. If you're watching the video, you can see the can. It's uh, it's hydrating me during this uh, um, allergy season I'm experiencing. But it's got no alcohol, no calories, zero sugar, zero carbs, man. It is so good. If you're like a sparkling water person like me, but you also like hoppy beer, this is this is the one for you. Um, yeah. So anyways, that's enough of that. Hans, yeah, I, I tell you, man, you got, you're going to have to be sponsoring this thing. Uh, all right, so that's my positive moment. I had a great time at Blyman Brewery this week. Uh, my second one is my parents sent me a little gift in the mail. My parents, uh, big listeners to the pod, and uh, have always uh, supported me through all my endeavors and all the the uh, nonsense and trouble I get into at times, even as an older person now. But they sent me this little John Deere 7720 combine for the studio. I'm going to park it up there, um, maybe by the lunch kit, or maybe it'll make it to the top shelf as well. But this combine, the 7720, is the first combine that I ever uh, you know, operated. And so all the machinery on the wall behind me, the toys, We've got the 4020 up there. We've got the 4440. 4020 is the, the first farm tractor I ever drove with the loader. Uh, 4440 is probably the tractor I spent the most amount of time in uh, as well. And now we got the 7720 for the studio. So thanks, mom and dad, for that. And also, uh, my last one, and I, oh, I, I put it away. Anyways. Uh, back in in the the pandemic days, everyone started to come up with these new hobbies, and I know my wife, one of her hobbies was creating this fantastic new bread. Um, I don't know, I don't even know what she called it. She doesn't do it as much anymore. Uh, but everyone had these hobbies, right? And so during the pandemic, I went and bought like one box of hockey cards, and I'm like, oh, I collected hockey cards in 1990. Like I'm maybe that'll be my hobby. Well, I bought a, th a thing of cards. I'm like, Jesus is expensive. I went through them all. I'm like, yeah, I'm not really getting in, getting into this. Like, I'm, I don't know. I sent them all to my nephews. You know, they're, you know, turning like three and 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 uh, the older one's five. And so I sent them over to them. I said, have fun. I don't know if you guys will like these. 
anyways, a couple months ago, I was uh, I was back in the hobby store, and I'm like, oh, you know, yeah, maybe I'll buy another box. And they said, well, if you buy a box, you get a second box uh, when the the second tier comes out or that second level. And Connor Bedard's in that one. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, I'll buy a box, and yeah, I'll speak for one because uh, they're going to be, you know, tight, low, low supply. Anyways. I know the story's dragging on, but I go pick up this box of cards, and he says, hey, if you pull Connor Bedard, let me know. That thing's worth a bunch of money. Well, lo and behold, folks, I somehow pulled a Connor Bedard rookie card. I, I, I sat there stunned. Of course, number one, I'm sitting there opening up these packs of hockey cards like I'm eight years old, right? But anyways, open up these cards, pull Connor Bedard, and I'm like, do I touch it? Like, what do I do with this thing? So I called him up. He's like, Ryan... You can come get a case for it. And I said, okay, well, is this thing actually worth anything? And he's like, you know what, Ryan? On Marketplace, they're selling between $600 and $2,500. So it's like, yeah, they're kind of worth a little bit of something. So anyways, I pulled this Connor Bedard card, and um, that's my third positive moment of the week. So maybe I do need to get into this hockey card hobby thing. We'll see. Uh, all right, folks. Um, enough of that uh, positive moment uh, nonsense for this week. But... Uh, let's talk about the, the hot topic of the week. And I've got two. So let's start with the fun one because it'll spill into the second one a little bit. One's fun and one's not as fun. Uh, the first one, though, is the, the demand for Canadian uh, wheat has been so strong all year, right? You guys have heard this time and time again. Uh, but we're starting to see some values here that uh, that are perking our perking my ears a little bit. Anyways, we saw some hard red trade at nine dollars a bushel, uh, so that would be for like a, a one thirteen five into Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, nine dollars. We haven't seen that for a little bit now, uh, but we're back at nine, which means Alberta is back in that nine fifty range. Okay, and so that demand is awesome to see. Um, how long will that be sustained? How long will these premiums be sustained? I'm not sure, but in your eating the veggie section, I'm going to have a call to action here. But it's it's a hot thing that's out there. The, the hard red spring wheat market, the demand for it is very good. Futures suck. Basis is doing all the heavy lifting. But I also want you to, to take a look around because certain companies are paying premiums over others, which is normal. Um, but there's pretty good demand from like G3s out there, for example, um, pretty consistent. And they're hitting targets well above posted bids. So it takes a little bit of homework, a little bit of checking to see what exactly that number is going to be. But in this environment, you kind of set your target higher, leave it sit there for a couple of days a week, maybe. And then you could scale it back a little bit if you want to, because you're trying to pick, you know, where's that level that merchant's going to going to hit and pay up for this wheat so you want to start a little bit higher and then work your way back if possible but it's a good news story and i do think you need to take action on it though and, and take advantage okay now my second hot topic of the week is when you look at the drought canadian drought map and i've got it on my phone here but the, the canadian drought map was updated here at the end of march and it uh it's a little unnerving, you know, when you look at it. It's a little bit, uh, it's, you know, a little threatening. You, you start looking at all the colors they have on here, but you, what you quickly realize is that the prairies, you know, every crop producing area of the prairies, I would say, I know there's one really tiny area that's okay, that doesn't show up here in, in any red or yellow color or brown color, but you know, the entire prairies had a dry winter and are experiencing, you know, drought-like conditions. But it's the whole area. You go up to the Peace, it's quite severe. Up in the Peace, even up into that Fort St. John in BC, like it's it's quite severe there. People looking for rain. Um, we've had moisture events in southern Alberta here lately. So maybe the drought map improves for them the next time it gets printed or comes out. But, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in Edmonton, Calgary, Saskatoon, Regina. You go into Manitoba as well, north of Winnipeg. You know, they they have a big yellow mark. And you say, well, what's the yellow mean? Well, abnormally dry. You know, abnormally dry. So we'll keep an eye on that. The, the, the hot topic here is for April. You know, if we, you know, they say plant in the dust and, and the bins will bust. Well, we're, 
we're planting in the dust. But we've also just gone through 2021 not long ago, the drought of 21. We've also gone through last year's growing season, which was, you know, many areas, many people experienced drought last year as well. And so you sit here and say, geez, this has to turn around here to, to get this crop growing. And, and what I'll say is it's a hot topic because it just shows, in my opinion, how important the rains are going to be this spring and this summer. All right. We know that soil moisture is, is uh, deficient in some areas and, and we know that we need rain, but we'll be looking at, you know, what happened over the last three days, seven days, what's the forecast look like? Like we'll be paying close attention because we, we need these rains, these consistent rains to come. And, and obviously as the crop gets bigger, the more important those rains are. So do we have enough to germinate the crop in many areas? Yes. Has moisture improved even since this was printed back at the end of March? Yes, for some moisture has improved. Peace region did receive, some parts of the Peace region received moisture. Some parts of Southern Alberta have re received moisture. So is it improving in areas? Yes, but we need more of that. We need more improvement. We need lots of rain out there throughout the prairie. So let's keep a close eye on that uh, as we move forward. All right, folks, let's uh, go over to our guest here, Ryan Coppithorn with Cows and Control. I'll let Ryan take it away. All right, folks, welcome back. Ryan Coppithorn to the What the Futures podcast. Ryan, how's uh, how's the start of your April going? How are things going? Well, it's going pretty good. We're just starting to get into calving here at home, and, and we've had a few snowfalls, so our sloughs and dugouts are starting to fill up, which is nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're hoping hoping we got enough soil moisture to get a start here too, but we'll, there's lots of time for that, I hope. Yeah, you bet. It, yeah, early April here. Nice to see the precipitation for sure, but um, you just got to keep it coming here. That's that's for sure. Um, have you guys always started calving in, in April? Has that been part of the, the your strategy for like many, many years? Or were you guys calving at different times in, in history? Or what's the strategy there? We've pretty much calved in April for a long time, like April, May. Uh, we try and get past the winter storms because we're where we are here we're not touching these cattle like they they got to do it on their own so okay. we're just out making sure there's no problems or whatever but at the end of the day these cattle are doing it on their own so we try and do it after the storm seasons very that sounds pretty smart to me you bet and how many do you expect how many uh are you calving up uh at, the, at home here we'll have six or seven hundred head of calves here on the go wow all yeah. right I can see why you want them out there doing it on their own. It's uh, it's busy. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah. I don't do much of that anymore. I'm more of a consultant than a rancher now, but our family yeah. is still operating that. So, oh, I'm sure you can go get uh, get some mud on the boots whenever you need, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Um, well, kind of on that note here, off the hop, I, I know we got some big topics to cover off today, and there's been a pullback in this market, but I've been involved in in consulting for farmers on the on the grain side you know for the last you know over a decade and i've never had a farm come to me and say we would like to get you know into cattle or we'd like to expand our herd numbers um i've never i've never seen that or i've never had anyone ask that or been a part of that conversation until now and so the last couple of weeks i've had a few different scenarios, but one was a farm thinking about diversifying and getting into cattle. Uh, the other one, um, they uh, were thinking of adding to their numbers. And, and the third scenario was that I was chatting with a, a mixed farm that was thinking of of reducing the, their workload and getting out of getting out of cattle at this time. But uh, it sounds like they're going to stick it out a few more years yet with the way these markets are going. So I. I Going back to the original point, though, is uh, are are we? What do you think of that? Farmers, grain farmers, getting back into cattle is that a real thing? Yeah, it's something I've been sort of anticipating or thinking could happen, and it's interesting to hear you say that because um, first of all, well, obviously the grain prices are low and cattle prices are high, so there's a, there's a natural yeah. market switch there. But um, the whole regenerative agriculture movement 
that's going on now. And, and when you look at that carbon intensity score movement that they're doing in the U S now that mm -hmm. requires cover crops and, um, swapping out fertilizer for manure and things like that are, these are natural inclinations to want to look at, like, if you're doing regenerative agriculture, you pretty much need cattle. If you're growing cover crops or trying to use other force, uh, sources of fertilizer. So, yeah. um, it sounds kind of a, like a natural next step progression for that to be. And I've been trying to figure out where the next buyer of these cattle is going to be because our, our ranching numbers, our producer numbers are shrinking. Like we've cut our numbers down in half in 20 yep. years. Yep. And so we're getting really tight in terms of cattle producers. And it, I, I've been wondering this, that very thing, if farmers are going to be the ones that end up being the marginal buyers of these cattle going into this cattle market. And so it, it seemed very logical that that would be the case. It, it's uh, it's not a small undertaking, obviously. Like I, if you're if you're going to get into this again, it's going to take some planning and and take some work to get set up. Like I think you know of our farm, you know I grew up you know just south of Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and and you know we had cows, we had uh, a hog barn, we had horses, chickens. You know we kind of had had a little bit of everything uh, growing up on the farm. But we haven't had cattle since uh, oh, it's been a, a very long time. Um, it's got to be 20 years, maybe more. And uh, if, if we wanted to get back into it, like there's a lot of, of upkeep, uh, a lot of not upkeep anymore. It's, it's um, infrastructure that needs to be uh, updated or improved or changed. So it's not easy. <laughs> No, and the business is more complex probably than than what you remember. And um, you know, it's it, it a lot, in a lot of ways it's still the same old cattle business, but there is a lot more complexity and the red tape and regulation and those type of things always increase year to year. So it's never as easy as you think to get back in. Yeah. But um, it is a good cattle and farming are, are there's great synergies. Like the the cattle are are very beneficial to to um, grain farms in terms of being able to clean up byproducts and being able to, you know, if you have failed crops, cattle are always a backup and those type of things. So there's a lot of advantage yeah. to it. But a hundred percent. I, and I know the one farmer I was chatting with, um, you know, they have three or 400 head and, you know, as they were talking about their crop mix for 2024 and what to plant, the cattle came into the conversation and, and they decided to do, you know, a few more cereals. But the crop had, depending on how it was going to turn out, had multiple homes that it could go to to, to generate value and, and income. So, yeah. yeah. So that, that's been just something that I haven't experienced before. And I, I thought that was kind of neat and, and cool. So, um, well, so it we'll actually sets up very nicely for um, younger producers to be able to work, younger cattle producers to be able to work with farmers. Like if farmers aren't comfortable with with running cattle in today's world, you know, I think it, it would give it some opportunities for young cattle people to get started that maybe oh, yeah. can't afford the land, but but would yeah. be able to access farmland for running cattle. So I think it could be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's uh that's something we'll have to keep in mind and, and maybe circle back on in the future as well. So good point. Yeah. Um so obviously there's you know long-term excitement in in cattle but let's talk about what's been happening over the last couple of weeks here what's going on with cattle prices well like always seems to happen in these markets you we've had a pretty good run since december um cattle market you know had a big dip last fall and then ever since december it's just been running straight up until about march Yep. And then just very conveniently, when you get to these good prices again, all of a sudden we get news of avian flu entering the dairy herd. And and that's yeah. caused us a bit of concern in the cattle business, and it's caused a bit of a sell-off in the futures. Um, we've had, I guess there's um, avian flu and dairy herds in six states in the U.S. right now. Okay. And um, I think there's only 16 cases overall, but what really got the headlines is when one of the workers at one of these dairy farms contracted the, the avian flu from the cow and the yeah. cow contracted it from these migrating birds, you know, this time of year, all these birds are yeah. migrating North and they're carrying avian flu. 
they land in the barns or land in the feedlots. And, and now it started to sort of transmit to the dairy cattle. And as far as the dairy cattle, all it does is it sets them off feed for a day or two, and then they're right back, back to normal. Like, okay. You know, so it's not I, a big, it's not a big serious disease in, as far as the cattle are concerned, but it's got people worried, you know? Well, we're, we're hypersensitive out there in relation to all this now. So, um, yeah. And I was going to, I was going to ask you like, what, what's the implication here? Like, what is the challenge if, you know, with, and you already answered it with what happens if your dairy cow gets this. So is this a little bit, um, in your opinion, do you think it's a little bit overdone then overblown to some degree, or do you think that we're going to get more tense about this topic in the next days and weeks? Well, I don't like it. Like, I don't like the fact that the news just keeps bleeding new information every single day. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it sounds to me like people are kind of piling on the story a little bit, which concerns yeah. me because they can, they can take it way too far. Um, what's happening now is there's 17 states in the U.S. that are looking at restricting the flow of, of dairy cattle into their states. Like, basically stopping interstate travel of these dairy cattle. And so when you start doing that, then it becomes a little sticky in terms of, you know, it comes awkward for moving cattle around. And, and then yeah. you have to look as a Canadian, you, you ask, well, if we get it in Canada, will they want to restrict, you know, cross border flow. And so that's where it becomes a little scary from our side of the fence. So far, our, our prices here in Can in Canada haven't moved. They, they've, okay. you know, we're still sitting at the highs here. We haven't moved. Whereas the only thing that's really come down is the futures prices. And right. so at eventually these cash prices will follow the futures market lower, but they haven't so far. So the restriction of, of movement, um, and I don't want to bring up, you know, past uh, nightmares, but we'd go back to a situation like BSE would be the last time that we saw that. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I don't think it'll get there. I, I really don't, but it's, you never know, like the way these, the way people can overreact sometimes it's, you always have to be cautious. So, you know, this is why we do risk management, even in bull markets. I mean, I, I really believe that we're still in a very strong bull market, but yeah. bull markets don't go up straight. They go up in zigzags, you know, and I think we're in a zag right now. Yeah. And they definitely don't go up in a straight line. That's for sure. And, and then, you know, there's usually opportunity here involved with this, like opportunity mm -hmm. to make a decision or opportunity all around the, the zag or the zig, depending on what's coming at you. So, uh, all right. Okay. So anything else in regards to this avian bird flu situation? I, I agree with you. They're going to overdo it. The media it has a, tendency of, of doing that overdoing this darn thing um but anything else that we need to know about well i think in in regards to that like the pullback that we're in with the futures it's it's corrected now like 50 to 60 percent of yeah. the gains that it's made since december so it's at a level right now where it's done a significant pullback mm -hmm. so there's a chance that if it finds ground here then we're away to the races that was the correction yeah but I can tell by the news flow and the way the futures are acting. I don't think it's over yet. It just, it's got a very soggy feel to it. Yeah. So I'm expecting that these futures markets could possibly go to the December lows and which is, you know, another couple 20 cents below us and uh, it's 20 cents below us basically. Okay. And so there's a possibility of that happening if this thing stays weak, but um you know, that would be a pretty extreme case, I would think. With uh, with it being spring now, um, from a futures perspective, do cattle futures, do they tend to relax during this time and pull back anyway? Or are they usually higher during the spring and summer? Like, what's, what's that kind of look like? Yeah, that's a good question. Because with the feeder cattle, I've, I've been waiting for weakness that usually happens about now. March, April is usually kind of a low point for, for feeder cattle. And we never really saw that. Like we had that big rebound since December and we never saw a pullback. So this is actually a very seasonal time for it to play games like this. 
but usually from May to September, that thing starts to rip again. And so I'm having, yeah. I, you know, my expectation on seasonality is that we're probably going to have this bird flu as an excuse for a pullback here in March, April. And by yeah. May, we'll be off to the races again. And by September, we'll be at much higher prices. Yeah. All right. So what you're telling me is is build my infrastructure real quick here and get ready for the next round. Yeah. I've got, I got a couple of weeks. All right. Sounds yeah. good. Um, <clears throat> All right. What about um, uh, other market stories that you're watching, or other other things uh, to take note of here on the cattle market? Well, one of the more bullish things to look at is these these cull cow prices. Um, cull cows are generally like our cows when they're processed through the through the meat system. They end up being um, lean beef. They're they're ninety percent lean beef generally. <laughs> And so those that lean beef goes into sort of the lower cuts. It goes into hamburgers, but it's also mm -hmm. used to blend um, with the steers and heifers that are fed to to much higher levels where they got a higher percentage of fat. And so there's been a shortage of cows, which has driven the price of cows, cull cows to a very high level. Mm -hmm. And it's also driven the price of lean beef to a very high level. And I look at lean beef prices as kind of like the barometer for what the overall meat um, prices are, are doing. Okay. And the fact that they're so high is a very bullish thing to me. And it just shows you that we're really running short of cows. Like in the U S we're down to 1950s levels here in Canada, we're down to 1980s levels. Like yeah. we're, we're at very low numbers. We have high productivity. We're producing lots of beef from yeah. those low numbers. But at the end of the day, that those high cull cow prices are demonstrating that, that the shortage of cows is starting to appear. And the demand side of this equation, um, the consumer, any any thoughts around their trends right now? Or obviously with warmer weather, like I know my barbecue has been fired up a lot here lately and we yeah. had you know burgers a few times, but the consumer continues to, to buy for the most part, like, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. They 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 do continue to buy. I just got back from the states. I was down in Palm Springs and just to see the wealth down there, you know, the, to see people what it costs to eat in a restaurant and people are the restaurants are all full. Yeah. Um but when you look at the beef prices in general, like the retail beef prices are still making all-time highs. So yeah. they're still climbing. Maybe the volumes might be dropping off a bit, but the prices are still climbing. Yeah. And what we're actually seeing, though, is some substitution. We're starting to see the what they call the choice select spread. And choice is basically your high quality, highest quality beef in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And select is kind of like the you know regular quality. And we're seeing select prices actually be more than the choice prices, which means that uh, retailers and 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 um, food marketers are are actually looking for the lower quality cuts. They're actually paying up for lower quality cuts which is also okay. why those cull cow prices are high too. So we're yeah. seeing a bit of substitution now to lower end cuts rather than the stakes and the high end stuff. But at the end of the day, demand is really strong. Yeah, you bet. Awesome for, for the cattle, cattle guys for sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I was looking at the, uh, and it's one of my big stories of the week here, but I was looking at the latest drought monitor uh, for the prairies. I know you talked about the sloughs being full and some, moisture events lately in your backyard but uh any thoughts around that the drought map and the weather and its impact to cattle or cattle prices i don't think we're out of this thing yet i think you know it's these snowfalls that we've been getting out west here have been nice but they're not uh they don't seem to be universal across the province i i still talk to people that haven't had any moisture and and uh I don't know. It's, you know, we, we could sure use a lot of moisture yet. Like we've just kind of filled some of the sloughs and stuff, but I don't know if our soil moisture is back to where it should be yet. So yeah. I think there's a ways to go. We, I, but it does feel different. Like it's, to me, it feels a little bit better than it has in terms of spring moisture. So let's, let's hope for some spring rain here. Yeah, for sure. You bet. Um, all right. Anything else before we, uh, before we let you go this week, anything else you want to add? No, I don't think so. I think we kind of covered covered most of it. I think we're still in a in a big bull market. These bread prices are very strong. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe they I won't I don't know if they're too strong, but they're 
they're very high um, compared to where they have been. And uh, we're seeing like bread cattle at $4,000 now, which is, you know, seemed unheard of a few years ago. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot of bullishness in that sense and I hope it, I hope it maintains. And, and uh, so I, I'm hoping this is just a pullback that we've just seen the most of and that we're ready to take off to the races again. Yeah, you bet. Okay. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for joining. Good luck with calving here this spring. Have a, uh, I don't know how to, how to say it, but uh, not a safe calving, but a productive one, I guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, every one of those little critters is worth lots of money now, so we got to make sure they survive. <laughs> Keep them alive, you bet. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, yeah. Ryan. Okay, you bet. Thanks. Always great to have Ryan on the show covering the cattle market for us. Lots going on in cattle these days, obviously, and uh, still lots of excitement out there too, which is good. Uh, all right, um, moving along here now to the uh, mailbag segment which is sponsored by pioneer seeds we are giving away one more bag of p 516 l uh, this month so you're gonna get that uh we'll draw for that later in april the kind of last episode is per normal of the month and we'll get that to you in short order because uh obviously it won't be long uh, until you're uh, planting canola so uh we're gonna do it one more time and then maggie over at pioneer said you know what ryan leave it with me we're going to switch it up for the month of may and uh, come up with something fun and uh, yeah so we'll leave it with maggie to figure it out for may forward but again folks all you have to do is email ryan at what the futures podcast.ca you ask me a question uh you've seen the examples before we've had all sorts of questions come in farm business related is best uh, crop marketing related is great i'll get my friends involved if needed uh, but for this week, we have a question from Alden. Only the one came in, but it's a great question. And he says, why is there so much spread on the basis from old crop to new crop? Hard red is a dollar less for new crop and canola uh, about 50 cents less. Um, 50 cents per more per bushel. Oh, more. So the worst basis. Yeah. So 50 cents on, on the canola. Is this common or is this quite a bit of a spread? All right. So basis is a bit of a representation of what's happening uh, locally in your market. Obviously, futures are traded uh, globally. Uh, basis is, uh, is part of what's happening in your backyard. It also has a global aspect as well. Uh, you're seeing it right now on wheat the demand for wheat and those uh historic great basis levels across the prairie provinces here now but uh let's talk about wheat to start with so back in the day um back in my my earlier days in my earlier career um i, I was told by merchants that when it came to uh, demand for wheat no country or buyer was really sticking their hand up a year in advance like hey i want to buy a whole bunch of wheat for next year it, it was kind of just a, a few months before hand where they'd say yeah we're ready to buy now or we want so many tons um and so you know what we see today in in wheat basis old crop is is phenomenal and we know what that demand looks like we you know we're actively as a country as these line companies they're, they're selling this you know each and every day right now and so on and so forth. So you've got strong demand, you've got strong, uh, you know, buyers out there and, and historic great basis level. For new crop, basis levels are, they're okay with that low Canadian dollar. They're fine. Um, but there's not a whole bunch of demand out there yet. And so you kind of sit there and, and, and we also don't know what the crop looks like. We know that farmers across the prairies, you know, may, may uh, see that a few less uh, spring wheat acres. We don't know how many bushels there'll be. Nobody's panicking though and saying, oh, we're in a shortage. We got to, you know, buy what we can, gain market share or, or keep our spot in, in market share. They're not really willing to improve basis levels at this time. They're also not seeing the demand come across yet. So the basis levels for new crop, I don't want to say that they're fake. They're not fake, but you know, could you see basis levels improve into fall? You know, 100%. Could they get worse? 100%. Both scenarios can and will happen. 
Uh, but they throw a number out there that, you know, in my opinion, for new crop, just kind of um, goes back to historics or goes back to a number that they'd feel comfortable trading. And, uh, you know, when I look at marketing wheat at this time of year and in, in the scenario we're seeing, I don't know if demand continues into the fall. But I'm willing to take a bit of a shot at it to see and, and locking in my futures and leaving my basis open. And the other thing, too, is I go back to that drought map from earlier. And are there going to be some scares across the prairies? Is there going to be an issue with production in some areas? How big of an area? You know, I, I'd leave my basis open for some of that and uh, and 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 see what happens there. I'd, I'd lean towards today a, a slight improvement in basis due to lower Canadian dollar, uh, due to the, the strong demand that we're seeing, a uh, few less acres, weather, you know, is a question mark trending on the drier side overall. So you leave that basis open and you maybe lock in your futures when you're doing that. So again, always seek the advice of a professional. The canola one's really, really interesting, okay? Because I was just looking at a few scenarios and um, what you would expect is to see like a great basis here in May. You know, the everyone's planting a crop. No one wants to deliver canola. So you'd see a great basis in May and your best price. And then maybe June, July, August, your prices drop a little bit. And then for fall, your prices drop even, even more. But futures have carry. So futures are higher the further you go into November. And so, uh, you know, that we haven't seen that the last couple of years. That's a sign, it's one sign of a bearish market as well, is seeing that carry. They're paying you to store that canola later on. Uh, but we're, we, I noticed, you know, even at uh, well, Bungi, the best price for canola between now and, and the end of the year was in November. You know, that's a bit strange to see that. Uh, I looked over at G3 in Saskatoon and their price was basically flat from today all the way to the fall. Now, if futures are climbing, that means their basis levels are worse for fall. And that's what you would expect, right? You'd expect basis levels to be worse, but that carry, uh, prices are kind of, they're remaining flat there. So anyways, um, basis levels for fall on canola, you'd expect them to be worse because that's when there's, Farmers want to move canola. They're harvesting it. They want to move some of it. You know, it's easy to buy. Basis level is traditionally much better in the spring when it's harder to buy, and summer is a bit of a toss-up. This summer, you're unless we have a severe drought, that's the caveat here, but you're not going to see... If you're going to carry over 3 million tons, some of you have to carry the canola over that have never or haven't carried it over before or, or in a very long time. So you may not see that big basis appreciation this summer. I, I would venture that you won't see that basis appreciation this summer. And uh, you're going to see a peak here of, of May. And then you're going to see that fall off for June and July. And then some of you will sit here. Like if you're in Bungie, Fort Saskatchewan, you're going to say, well, I'm not going to get rid of this in August. I'm just going to hold it now and get the higher price in November. Right? So it's part of it. It's all part of this carryover conversation as well. Uh, what else do I have to say on canola basis? <laughs> I think I think that's about it. Uh, hopefully that helps out a little bit, Alden, and uh, provides a little bit of clarity around that. But I, I hope I explained that as best I could. <clears throat> uh, all right. Um, okay, crop prices segment. Uh, next segment is crop prices and news. And we're getting close to the end here, folks. But there's going to be a USDA report. By the time you listen to this podcast, the USDA report has already happened. So we won't touch into it or talk about it a whole bunch here. Um, but we've got that going on this week. Conab also, I know they dropped Argentina corn production on Wednesday. Um, but we'll see how that sets direction, if there's any big implications here. I, I expect this, this, I expected this USDA report to be a bit of a quiet one, but I guess by the time you listen to this, we'll already know. Uh, so let's talk about some different pricing action out there. Uh, peas, lots of uh, support in, in pea markets. And I just want to just clarify here, like for old crop, you know, I, I guess you could be the last one holding out. Like if you haven't sold your green peas at 20 bucks for old crop, you're the last one 
you know, holding, holding out, but don't be, <laughs> don't be that one. Cause once demand goes away, the price drops to 13 or 14 bucks. So take the 20, call it a good, you know, good day and, and walk away. Same thing with your maple, maple peas. They go from 25, 26, all the way down to 20. I, again, I don't want to see you lose $5 a bushel. All right. And, and yellow peas is basically the same thing. Not quite as extreme, but 13 to 14 dollars for old crop yellow peas and new crop are 10 to, to 11 50 or in that range but uh, pea prices have picked up a little bit of strength here this week which is great and i haven't seen anything worthwhile for new crop that has me wanting to make additional sales here at this time but like i said last week looking to see what india does um they're you know they're already talking about how even though they're just harvesting, wrapping up harvest of this year's crop, but how weather patterns suggest that they're going to have a very good monsoon season and bigger crops next year. Anyways, who knows? Um, I want to be more of a pea seller here as well because uh, there's incentive globally to plant more peas. And uh, there's some question marks still around that Chinese demand. So anyways, folks, uh, just pay pay close attention to those pea markets right now. We've got green peas, you know, $14 picked up on farm with act of God was quoted in a few areas. I've been a seller at that level for new crop green peas, new crop yellows, uh, up to that 11, 1150 delivered with act of God. That's, you know, something to, to take a peek at as well. And then maples 19 to $20 there. Uh, all right. Uh, I wanted to touch on uh, oat prices as well. Not, they're not that exciting. They're firm. They're not doing much of anything, but they did climb a nickel in Alberta. So I thought the special they said last week was 475, but now they're 480 and still seeing lots of 450 bids for old crop oats in Saskatchewan. So not much new there, but just letting you know it firmed up a bit. And uh, hey, keep an eye on, on this weather market. Uh, if there's going to be some action here. It's, it's around the corner. And then barley prices, feed barley prices did pull back here. Uh, Again, I I talked to a few growers with some barley left to sell. And yeah, again, folks, it's a tough market out there. The the five dollar bids for feed barley or um you know, picked up Saskatoon or the 525 we saw picked up on Highway 16 here around Edmonton. You know, nothing to get too excited about. Um, but they, they have pulled back here as well. The you usually get this little rally in the spring, the the trucks. You know, the feedlot sits there and says, I need I need some barley. Like, the, it's not coming in as fast as it was. But we're just not seeing that. We're not seeing that shortage that typically happens. Uh, just, yeah, it's just not out there. So not fun for barley growers. Now, all right, uh, eating your veggies. Uh, next segment, eating your veggies, because it is the right thing to do. Uh, three things to focus on. Number one, before you get busy planting, and I know some of you are already, but if you get a chance here, I'd recommend you sit down. Now, I told you, asked you to take a bit of office time here around Easter. And hopefully you did that for yourself. Um, but important to, to just review your old crop inventory and store that somewhere. If you have a program, great. If you don't, maybe it's in your phone somewhere. But you store your inventory. And the reason you do that is you have your numbers close at hand. Because what happens if you're underneath the drill, your phone rings, you answer it. They say, oh, feed barley $6. You know, it's up 50 cents. Well, you got to jump on it. What, what, what do you got for bushels? If you have it right there, then you can make that decision. You, it's not a time of year where you want to say, hey, I'm going to get home tonight at some point. I'm going to try to sleep for six, five, six hours, you know, maybe. And I'll try to remember in the morning and hopefully I can figure that out for you. But if you just have that done, it's in your phone, then you can make a decision and, and act on it. And the same thing is you can write down right, right underneath it, just like your new crop marketing plan. You have some targets in mind, some bushels in mind, and uh, just write that down. Take a moment this week to write that down for yourself, okay? This is my favorite time of year as a grain marketing advisor because I would call, I would tell farmers, hey, like when I'm calling you this spring, like do your best to get back to me as soon as you can because stuff's happening. And often it was for pricing grain for the, even the next year, 2025. 
or in this scenario be 2025 but marketing for next year or taking advantage of deals that were popping up so it's it's a great time for advisors out there for sure all right second thing old crop wheat we already talked about it but get after it you know while the cooking's good uh go in and and fill your plate here get some get that sale done does it mean to take a basis contract i want to say no i hate doing a basis contract. But if you look at the time of year and the seasonals, I guess you can take it under consideration. But, uh, you know, if you were hoping for nine in Saskatoon and nine's there today, I, I just take it myself. If you want to play with bushels on basis, fine. But uh, get after it. Get that old crop wheat tidied up. Uh, demand's good out there. And then the last one, number three, is um, if you're a, a candidate for filling bins of fertilizer this summer. Um, James Mitchell, he'll be on again here next month, but he was on a few weeks ago. And we talked about summer fill being maybe in the fours uh, for urea. Uh, well, that expectation has changed now. And James will, he'll give us an update here next month. I'll let him talk about the latest. But I did hear rumors that that number could be in the threes now. So urea at three ninety nine a ton or less, okay? Is that going to trickle to trickle through to liquid um, twenty eight zero zero or or to anhydrous? I want to say no, but we'll see. Maybe it does. Um, but you know, if there's going to be some cheap urea around here, it sounds like Canadian retailers are putting their hands up for some of the supply. It's just not going to get here till after seeding. Uh, but it's going to be severely uh, discounted compared to the last number of years. So, you know, lock it into here, tune into here, and we'll talk about it as we see it, folks. That's what we do at the What the Futures podcast. Um, but if you're a candidate, just make sure that you, uh, you, you're you aware that you're a candidate, number one, that you want to take fertilizer in the spring and summer. And uh, then all you have to do is, uh, you know, pick up the phone when that call comes at you or, or make sure you stay in tune with that market. Okay. Uh, all right, folks, uh, housekeeping now, just a couple things. Uh, I do have a 2024 playoff hockey pool set up. It's on uh, officepools.com. Of course, you'll find it in the show notes. The league is what the futures and the password is limit up. It's, <clears throat> pardon me, the password is limit up, all one word. Um, all you have to do is check off boxes on who's going to be the top scorer in each section. It's really easy to do. And uh, we're going to have some prizes here as well. I'm not going to announce the prizes until after we get you signed up. But there's a deadline on there. I think we got about uh, a week or so to go on that. But come join uh, the What the Futures uh, Playoff Hockey Pool. Again, it's on Office Pools. You'll find it in the show notes as well. I also have a playlist going on YouTube music called What the Futures, hashtag plant24. And this is my little music, my cur curated playlist for planting uh, a crop here this year and and uh you know will it lead to a successful crop i'm not sure will it entertain you 100 percent um it's there my top song right now in the playlist is uh when doves cry by prince um i've had that one going quite a bit here the last couple of days so i hope hopefully you enjoy that playlist again it's on youtube music what the futures hashtag plant 24 is where you'll find it you just have to search that of course, folks, uh, thanks for tuning into the show. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, X, LinkedIn, all that good stuff. If you can like our stuff, share it. I appreciate it. I've got new hats coming. And uh, that's it for this week, folks. Have a, a great weekend. Stay positive out there. Have fun. Stay safe. And uh, I'm out. Peace.